St. John chapter 8 is where we're at. If you notice, this is not the triumphal entry. Um, this is a little message today that we're going to minister to you about our sin. And the title of today's message is Exposed. Everybody say, Exposed. And we're going to talk about this little story that some of us remember. But there's a little bit more to it. As is all pretty well all the stories in the Bible, there's more to it than just surface stuff. And uh, there's some really interesting things here that we want to bring to the church. Because everybody here, everybody, no exceptions, everybody here deals with the same stuff. And the main thing that we deal with is, is our own sinful nature, our own Adamic nature, that causes us from time to time to fall and to make mistakes and to do things that are not holy <laughs> before the Lord. And it is important that you remember that. There are certain things that we'll talk about today is very important for you, but every one of you today deal with issues of sin. Every one. There's no exceptions. Nobody's sitting here in a glorified body, right? Does, does anybody see anyone here with a halo over their head? Do you see any halos? No, I don't either. So nobody's about ready to levitate out of here or anything like that. So we all are in this human condition. And in that, we have mistakes that we make. And you say, not me, Pastor, not me. Please be careful what you say. I said, please be careful what you say. Because you don't want to be a liar. Nor do you want to be a hypocrite. Right? Your sin, well, my sin's not as bad big as anybody else's is there any qualification there of levels of sin sin is sin and so so there's an importance here to, that we need to place upon that there's sins of omission little things that sometimes we forget that we should be doing i said that we should be doing there's times that we anger right we get angry it's, an, it's a human emotion, but we get angry, right? We walk down the hall in the middle of the night, and the dogs made a mess in the floor, and we step in it. <laughs> our wonderful partner in life says something to get under our skin, and we get angry. Yeah. It's amazing your partner knows the exact word to say, just <laughs> Sometimes it's just a word, like Doris, you know, that doesn't mean anything to you. It means a lot to Sister Tyner, or Reginald, or, well, I don't care, it's, it's the way it is. It's the way it is, right? I love my mother-in-law, but it's still, it is what it is. Got to put that in there. We have little words that we say. Little things that we can pick on. Little things that we can accent. That, And then, then there's other issues. Lying, for instance. Do I look good in this? Do you like my hair like this? Look at me and smile. Yes, honey, you look so good. If you're smart. <laughs> oh. What? Then you have to repent. <laughs> you, go, you go to the Chinese buffet. The Holy Spirit is saying, don't add that extra piece of sushi on there or whatever. You know, I know that's Japanese, but they have it at Chinese for some reason. You know, don't, I'm picking on a son-in-law right now. Um, you know, we all have little things. Remember this, though. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's those little things that, that are so damaging because we neglect them and we neglect to remedy them. Look at me. I'm talking to you. 
because they seem to be small, we don't fix them. And so we end up with sin in our life. And I'm talking to everyone here. There's no exceptions to the rule. There's a reason why Jesus taught us to pray the way that he did. Forgive us of our trespasses. Right? There's a reason. We all need that. And this this story teaches us some things. So first of all, Jesus was in the temple. And I always like to mention that because it took years for me to figure out that Jesus was a rabbi. Duh. It took years for me to figure that out. That he spent a lot of time teaching in the temple. And people would come and hear him. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were part of that crowd. And on this particular day, there was a huge crowd because like what's going on in Indianapolis right now, they have this big contest, right? It's the something big. What is it? I know what it is. <laughs> but there's a lot of people there, right? And so this, in this particular instance, the day before they were just finishing up the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so that's a huge day in, in Jewish history. And so they were celebrating and people were there for the feast day. And people, you know, it takes a while for people to, to filter out. And this very, very important person that everybody was talking about was speaking and it was free to get in. That's pretty cool, right? So they come to hear this teacher. And a lot of people were there. So I'm going to read this story. I want you to pay attention to some of it. And then we'll talk about it. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people, how many? That means a bunch. And all the people. He's making a point here. Uh, come to him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we as such should be stoned. What, what do you say? This they said, testing him, that he might have something of which, they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first or, or cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus raised himself up, saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are thou those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now those of us that are raised the way I was raised, that bothers us because we're used to our little ounce of blood and pound of flesh and we want to make sure that people get just reward for what they do. So they need to be, you need to set them down. You need to deal with them harshly because they've done something really bad, right? So I always look at that, and I have to judge myself because of it because Jesus took such an easy stance on this, and there's a reason why. But first of all, let's break this down a little bit. 
So here's the scribes and the Pharisees, and Jesus doing this teaching, and people sitting there listening, and everything was interesting until there was a rustle in the uh, congregation. Somebody go back, Paul, go back and kind of rattle that door back there, just to rattle it a little bit. You know how people do. How come you're not looking? Because most of the time y'all look. <laughs> it doesn't take much. Everybody's attention goes, ah. What is that? Who's walking in? Who's late today? And so this commotion happens, and, and voices are heard, and maybe the distinct sound of a woman crying. Because if you're caught in adultery, where do you not want to be? Where do you not want to be? In church. Wow, you don't want to be in church. You don't want to be, because you're already embarrassed, humiliated, upset, and in this case, fearful. Why was she afraid? Because they were talking on the way out about how they were going to handle this. And they were talking about, you're going to get stoned, woman. We're not talking about with marijuana, right? Or drugs. They were talking about actual stones, man. You're going to get stoned. We're going to kill you. You're a bad, late, bad person. And I can tell you, Ron's sitting here. He's, he's arrested a lot of people, put them in handcuffs. Seen a lot of tears flow, Brother Ron. Everybody gets repentant, right? When you haul them off to the pokey. That's right. You need to haul them off to church. They need to let you do that sometime. Put them in handcuffs, bring them to church. <clears throat> I digress. So they were uh, bringing her in and all this commotion and Jesus, you know, obviously at one point or another has to stop and deal with the situation, right? Does he know their hearts? My guess is, yeah, he sees the group. He kind of understands what their motivation is. He knows it's not a good motivation. They're not there justly to handle something that was in the law. Uh, there was a lot of adultery all through time, right? And so some of these things, just like today, some of these things get overlooked. But their motivation wasn't pure. What they were trying to do is they were going to try to trip him up because are you going to adhere to the law of Moses, you teacher? You're talking about this new covenant, new, new time, new way of living, new in a living way. And, and here we are, uh, we are children of, of uh, Abraham, and, and we have Moses that wrote down the law. And are you going to follow after that or not? We're going to prove you. So what would we do? We, we would get upset. That's what we would do. Because as soon as, and, and we feel a lot of things. We know when people's motivation is not right. The Holy Spirit teaches us a lot of things. We know when somebody's trying to mess with us. And so what do we do? How do we handle it? We start doing this. We start mouthing off. We start attacking back. We start trying to cover our bases. And what does that do? What does that do? Does that open the door for healing? Does that change anything? What does it do? Makes more of a mess. So there's a lot of lessons to learn here. I don't know what Jesus was writing, if he was writing anything. He just stooped down and acted like he was writing on the ground. He wasn't even going to look at them. He didn't even know that they left until he got up and looked. But what was he doing? First of all, he was determined he was not going to play the devil's game. This is one thing I want you guys to learn. You're going to have a lot of confrontation in your life. The devil's going to try to trip you up just the same as he did Jesus. And you've got to learn how not to play the devil's game. The Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you that. Because the devil loves to set you up just to see what you're going to do. Amen. Hallelujah. And when you fall, he's there to remind you. See, I thought you were one of those Christian people. 
And here you are acting like that. You, you falsely accused me. You don't show love. And here you are now having to fix problems you didn't even have to fix because you, you shouldn't have gotten away in the first place. If you'll take your time, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to deal with things. Now, I'm, I'm telling you that because that's an inspiration of God. You need to learn how to let the Holy Spirit work on people. And when you speak, you need to speak the wisdom of God. Because life gets complex, especially when it comes to the human condition. And you're dealing with people. And it's not always an answer right off the cuff that's going to help people. We cause more, look at me, we cause more of a mess. And especially when it comes to other people and their sins and their problems, when we start mouthing off. Turn to somebody and kind of nudge them and say, ain't none of your business. Stay out of other people's stuff. If somebody's trying to get you to judge somebody else, refuse to do it. What do you think about that? I don't have an opinion on that. I give that to God. That's between them and the Lord. Whoo, glory to God. This is a shouting message today. I give it to God. That's not my business. Hallelujah. I know pastors should have handled that different. Look at him up there, so arrogant. Honey, we need to chill out, all of us. And let God handle all of this stuff. They belong to, to him. They don't belong to us. They're his children. That's what... Paul wrote, he said, they belong to God. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Okay, now I got that point in. We're going to move on. Look at me and smile. So how did Jesus handle it? What was his, uh, what was his way? He gets up under the inspiration. Remember, he said, I only speak the words of my father, right? He says this, you people who have not sinned, go ahead, pick up a stone. Come on, I'll wait on you. We'll get it done. Start, start, assemble yourself together, let's get this accomplished, but the only way you're going to be able to pick up a stone is if you have no sin, and then he just takes more time. And after a while, the room gets like this. It's quiet. People are being dealt with. It's at that moment that God is working. It's, it's okay for God to work. I, I plan on God working today on all of us today. I, my prayer is that He deals with me and He deals with you and we give Him time to do it because what are we doing otherwise? What, are we just here to appease ourselves, to entertain ourselves, to say things that are interesting so that we can say, oh, we've heard some wonderful things today? Or do we come to present ourselves before the Lord and hear a word from God and make some adjustments in our life because we want to be righteous before Him? Isn't that the plan? Isn't that what God wants us to do? Isn't it all right for us to look at ourselves? from time to time and examine ourselves, and if we, we need to repent at the moment, we will repent. God wants transparency. We're going to get into that. God wants us to be open before Him. Romans chapter 3. Somebody turn there with me today. We're going to look at some, a few little scriptures and try not to take too long, but I, I think these things are important um, to remind ourselves, you know, because more of, more of the time than not, we quote things, we just quote them, and we go on and people just kind of, they look it over and think about it and leave it go because they don't mark the Scripture and they don't know the Scripture, and so it's not really that important to them. But this book is what you're going to be judged by. 
I said, this book, the B-I-B-L-E book, the 66 books that make up one book, you better know the book. Not one part of this is going to pass. When the world's on fire, this is going to be here. It's a light into your path and a lamp into your feet. By his word, we keep it in our heart that we don't sin against God. So you better know the word. You do error, Jesus said, by not knowing the scripture. So how many of you feel like that's one that maybe you can work on? Maybe that's one of our sins, that we haven't taken advantage of this word. Study to show yourself approved. Unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you know the word? Do you know what you believe? Hallelujah. When's the last time you got in your Bible and looked? Come on, help me preach a little bit. We're going to get excited here. I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to become Bible-reading, believing Christians. I, I don't want you to have to rely on a man to understand what the Word of God has to say to you. God's given you the Holy Spirit to break the bread of life and to feed yourself. None of you will be able to stand before the Lord and say, I didn't know or understand. You all have access. There's people throughout the world that never had access to the Word, but you have access to what God has said. You got the book. You got the book. Say it with me. I have the book. I got the owner's manual. I'm blessed. There's people giving their life over just a few pages of this Bible. Trying to smuggle it into a foreign land. Giving their life for it. And you have it, maybe two or three Bibles sitting on the shelf somewhere. Have it on your phone. And you spend more time on the internet. Hum a little bit, it might help. Then you do the Word of God. The most important book ever written. Romans 3. Verse 23. For all have sinned. How many is all? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to listen to me real good. I really feel, can they follow me? I really feel that this wasn't really so much about the woman caught in adultery. I believe the Holy Spirit was setting up some of those scribes and Pharisees, the religious people, that was supposed to be training other people and bringing them to the point to where they were going to get their life right. Listen, what was the woman doing? She was doing what sinners do. There's no in indication that she was religious at all. She didn't address him in any certain way, or they didn't present her in any other way. This was just a woman caught in the act of adultery. She was a messed up cookie that was having an affair, maybe with somebody else's man. Somebody say, it takes two to tangle. Somebody else was guilty, right? But they all, always pick on the women, right women? There's always the women. You guys were justified on that one. She got picked on. Poor old woman. That's right. But I don't think it was about her. She was doing what sinner people do, and I believe that's why Jesus wasn't so hard on her. He said, you just need to quit sinning. She didn't have any great understanding of what the Word of God was. So there was no reason to try to go into some great big understanding of what Moses' law was. She just... He just looked at her and said, you need to quit doing what you're doing, lady. You have no accusers, go on. But what was this about? It was about the people that should know better. Living lives of sin 
and trying to condemn somebody else. Because how many have sinned? All have sinned. Being justified freely by His grace. Talked about grace for the last few weeks. How many depend upon grace? Oh, come on. You, you don't know what you're talking about if you don't raise your hand. You've got to have the grace of God because of your sinful nature. Because you do fall. You do fail. All right? Let me go to another scripture. First uh, John chapter 1, verse 6. All right? If we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So darkness doesn't represent truth. Darkness represents living in a lie. And how many know the world's living in a lie? They would rather believe a lie. They don't want to hear the truth. We live in a generation that absolutely do not want to hear nor understand the truth. So when Paul wrote what he said to Timothy, he was exactly right. He said they would rather turn from the truth and be turned to fables because that's what they want to hear. And that's how the world lives today. But you can't be in fellowship with God and walk in darkness. You have to walk in what? What's opposite than darkness? In light. Light bears witness to what's right. And that's a requirement that God will have for you, and you need to listen to me. You're going to sin, you're going to fall, you're going to fail, because you're a human being. But God wants you to always walk in light or honesty. God is true, and He is the truth, and in Him is no darkness, no lies. It's impossible for God to lie, because He is the way the truth and the life. So when you look at God, you're always going to get truth. And He expects truth if you're going to walk with Him. Now, that's where it's important. That's how we're going to make heaven. It's not because you've lived an absolutely perfect life. It's because you've walked in light and not darkness. It's because you've walked in truth and not fables, not hypocrisy, but you've been open and honest before the Lord. That is why I believe in teaching an altar experience, that this altar will always be your friend. You must always have a relationship with God through an altar. You've got to always be willing to say, God, forgive me of my sins and my unrighteousness. I have sinned. I have failed. I have done wrong. And I want to be right. That's the only way you're ever going to make heaven is to walk in light. I wanted to sink in. Now he goes on to explain this a little bit. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If we don't, then we won't. If you don't walk honestly before the Lord, you have no fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, then say, had does it say had or have pastor we're all saved folks here you're saved by God's grace not saved because you're righteous there's none righteous no not one whose righteousness do we walk in his right. That's the only righteousness that we can have is His righteousness. Your righteousness is not true righteousness. God's ways are much higher than your ways. You'll never achieve that. The only way to do that is through the grace and through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the redemptive process that's with you the rest of your life as you walk with God. 
This is way above some of your heads. You're not even receiving this. But redemption is always taking part in your life as long as you walk with God. The cross has never lost its power. The cross has never lost its influence. The blood of Jesus has never stopped flowing. And that's why you always need that relationship with the Lord. You can't do this on, the, on your own and without the blood of Jesus that covers you, you'll never make heaven. So you always must. I get in a rough voice and I lose some of you. But you always must walk in relationship with him. Follow me. That's why this was so important. These people were walking in air. They had this spirit of deception that was plaguing them and they could only see the faults of someone else. And they were children of Abraham. They were they were working in the temple where people needed to find God. And they were so confused. And that's why Jesus would call them whited sepulchers. You can only clean up the outside. you full of excess and dead man's bones internally. Because that's all you know. You have a form of godliness. I don't know that anybody's walking that way today. Do you, Clay? You're all churchy. You smell like church. You look like church. You tell everybody that you're churchy. And so they look at you and think that you're churchy. And I don't know that that's good for you. So I'm trying to help you to make heaven. That's, that's it. This is one of the best messages that I've preached for a long time. It's just because we all need to hear this. This guy, this boy. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, see, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, 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 if what, what's saying, if you don't, then you won't. You're still in your sins if you don't confess your sin. If you don't acknowledge that you have sins yourself, that's all Jesus was trying to get them to do. Was to deal with their sins. What's our tendency? Our tendency is to hide our sins. Can you do that? From me? Yeah, you can. There's some of you sitting. I would, I would put you in a position in a heartbeat. Oh, you're the best thing since gravy. Look at you. You're smiling and you got a little nice little spirit about you. We need, and you've done, you know, messed up three times this week and know about it. Know what you've done. It's been way too long at the CG bar. Doing things that we should not be doing. And I know, Frank, you're on a diet. I understand you're trying to, you're doing better than I am, son. <laughs> Letting the devil do things in our life. And, and so when we, we get to church, we look for any kind of little fig leaf we can use to put over us so that you can't see. And it's not you we need to be worried about. It's not, look, at, look at somebody say, it's not you, neighbor. I, I, right. I'm not trying to, I, I don't need to be worried about what you think of me in the first place. And trying to hide myself from you may not even be good. You know, probably one of the best things I could do from time to time is just to remind you, hey, I, I make mistakes too. Right. Right. 
I got my own issues. Right? Adam and Eve tried to cover their sins with fig leaves. And does that work? Look at me. Absolutely does not work. Because God sees you, right? We're like the little kid that closes their eyes like this. You can't see me. Or an ostrich that puts its head in the sand, that big butt sticking up out of the ground. Like that's going to fix it, right? Or like me when I was a kid going behind the shed smoking. Yeah, that. God didn't know that, right? My parents weren't smart enough to figure that out either, right? That's why they gave me a lecture, you know, the same night was in the car. And they said, you know, people that smoke end up with health, health issues. And I'm sitting there sweating beating up on my forehead. You think they understood? I thought I could eat cookies and get that off my breath. Put a little Glade, you know, air freshener on my clothes. Every parent in the room knows exactly. You know, little Johnny and Susie's in the front room playing and and, uh, they're they're not supposed to have certain shows on the TV and you go up and go in there and uh, what's some of them crazies that's on TV where they're all arguing all the time and so on. Who's, whose child is it? So you're just telling on yourself. You shouldn't. The rest of, rest of them was being smart. You guys played right into that. Anyway. Which one of you kids turned that on, you know? And the, the, the one said, I didn't do it, Mom, and the others with a pickle face. I'll shut up. They won't figure that out. You, you can't hide your sin before God. So what do you do? Come on, I'm, I'm getting ready to close here. What happens, man? Because... The Bible says you sin willfully. There remains no sacrifice. But a certain fearful looking toward judgment. The Bible says when you sin, you trample underfoot the Lord Jesus Christ and count the blood of the covenant as though it's nothing. So sin is, is an awful thing, but See, see, well, we're destined for hell. Every one of us is going to hell because Pastor Tyner's preaching one of them messages. Look at me, man. You know better than that. I already told you. God just wants transparency. If any man sin, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate. With the Father. And what's his name? Jesus. And if you're faithful to confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. You're getting ready here in just a minute to take communion. One of the most precious things that you can do. And yet, in many churches, we just fly up to the front or we get way down our little aisle and everybody and his brother is just... (laughs) It got that way in Paul's day. And people were partying and going home drunk while other people didn't have anything to take communion with. He'd gotten completely out of hand. He finally, he had to tell him, say, listen, man, you're using this as an excuse to party. It's not every time that you come together you need to be doing this. And you need to understand people that take this unworthily, some have gotten sick, and some have died. Yet the church, can I tell you, this is what bothers me. The church basically remains the same. 
And in some cases, we're more lax than we've ever been. And our biggest problem's not the world around us because they're just doing what sinners do. Look, it doesn't get any worse than basically than what that woman did, right? People out there, they're just doing what sinners do. That's not our problem. Our problem is right here. Close your eyes. Paul asked a question. Shall we all sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? I'm not making an excuse for your sin. I'm saying your sin needs to be dealt with, brother. Brother. Sister, young person, your sin needs to be dealt with. Every one of you, me, Sister T, Amy Brooks, Brother Ron, all of us. Brother Larry, surely not. Oh, God, surely not. These people are, are above reproach. Friend, everyone 